When conflict broke out in Afghanistan in 2001, the Queen wanted both William and Harry to battle the Taliban before concluding it would be too difficult to send the future heir to the throne, an ex-army head has disclosed in a violation of etiquette. The late Elizabeth II and General Sir Mike Jackson, the previous commander of the British Army, met to consider whether the princes should take part in the fight. What goes on in those audiences and who says what to whom stays for the two persons concerned, and I will violate the rule about not disclosing what goes on on this one occasion, Sir Mike says in a forthcoming ITVX documentary titled The True Crown. She was rather direct. My grandkids have seized my shilling, therefore, they must perform their responsibility, she remarked. That ended the matter. Yet, it was judged that William's danger was too great because he was the successor to the heir, yet the risk was acceptable to his younger sibling. According to the True Crown, the Queen gave her choice a lot of thinking since she had access to comprehensive information about the dangers that UK military men would experience in Afghanistan. She has full access to everything, Sir John Scarlett, who was then in charge of M6, claimed. She has had full access to an amazing quantity of knowledge and insight for longer than anybody else. William was quite eager to leave. He said she is incredibly discreet, totally dependable, and fully detail-oriented. Wow, Her Majesty knows more about this than we do now. I recalled thinking at the time. After graduating from college, William took a 44-week training course at the Royal Military College Sandhurst. In December 2006, he was commissioned as an army officer. Before joining the Royal Air Force and Navy, he served in the Household Cavalry Blues and Royals from 2004 to 2008. Throughout his 10 years in the Army, Harry completed two operational tours of duty in Afghanistan in 2007 to 2008 and 2012 to 2013, earning the rank of captain. The documentary demonstrates that William's status as a future king prevented him from enlisting in the military despite his desire. William was quite eager to attend, according to Mark Cann, director of the British Military Foundation, quoted in the series. Unequivocally, yes, but, it was difficult, and several extremely wise and knowledgeable individuals expressed their opinions. Everyone in the military who hasn't participated in an operation feels disappointed, and that particular conflict at the time was particularly difficult since everyone nearby had been a part of it. There is so a feeling of disappointment. Also being examined in the series, which premieres on April 20th, our plot lines from the Netflix show The Crown. ITV adds that the documentary offers insight into the Queen's viewpoint during significant events and has fresh interviews with important personalities, some of whom have never spoken on camera. In his autobiography Spare, Prince Harry disclosed that during his second tour of service in Afghanistan, he killed 25 Taliban militants. The Duke of Sussex, also known as Captain Wales in the military, said in a letter that he did not view the dead as persons but rather as chess pieces that he had removed from the game board. It was the first time he had mentioned the number of militants he had personally eliminated throughout his four months of service as an Apache helicopter pilot in Afghanistan on his second tour. After the terrible passing of his mother, Princess Diana, Prince Harry claimed that his military career saved him by enabling him to transform his anguish into purpose. He told 60 Minutes interviewer Anderson Cooper during a riveting tell-all interview on January 8, My military service rescued me in many ways. That took me out of the UK press's limelight. I could concentrate on a goal greater than myself, feel normal for the first time while donning the same uniform as everyone else, and overcome some of the hardest hurdles I've ever faced. According to the Duke of Windsor's nurse, Queen Elizabeth I, I broke Edward Vihart when she rejected his dying request to give Wallace Simpson the HRH title. Only ten days before he passed away, the Queen disregarded the dying desire of the Duke of Windsor, her favorite uncle, according to a recent documentary. When she famously visited Edward Vi at his and Wallace Simpson's home in Paris, France, at age 46, she reportedly turned down his desire to give his wife the HRH title. The deceased monarch, who passed away in 1972, 
gave up the kingdom in 1936 out of love for Wallace, an American divorcee. Julie Alexander, the Duke's nurse, claimed the rejection broke his heart in an interview for the Ray All Crown, inside the House of Windsor, which shares on ITVX on April 20th. He was gravely ill, she claimed. If he hadn't eaten anything, his weight couldn't have been more than 80 pounds. Although extremely self-conscious about his looks, the Duke insisted that he would sit up in a chair not in bed, and wear clothing to cover any tubes. Notwithstanding its somber character, Wallace hosted the late monarch for the first time during this visit. Julie responded, the queen said no. She refused, even on that depressing day. I imagine that it was tearing his heart. He desired for her to have that title, after all. That was a smack in the face not to have that title for his wife. The Crown on Netflix also featured a scene from the visit that occurred in May 1951. Elizabeth talked to Uncle David as he was known to close relatives alone before emerging with only the Duchess for a portrait. The Duke passed away on May 28, a little over a month before turning 78. When word of Edward's connection with Wallace, who had been married twice before joining him, initially surfaced, it caused a controversy. When her divorce from her second husband was still pending, his proposal to marry her triggered a constitutional crisis that resulted in Edward's decision to surrender. Upon his abdication, Edward was given the titles of His Royal Highness and Duke of Windsor by his brother, the new King George Vi. Edward, however, was unhappy with the king's decision to issue a letters patent, which denied Wallace the title of Her Royal Highness after their 1937 marriage and desire to stay in France. With the help of his brother's tax-free stipend, Edward could continue leading an opulent lifestyle with Wallace. It comes after a historian said last year that Edward chose to surrender because of how his father treated him, turning him into a rebel who lacked the self-discipline to rule. According to history professor Jane Ridley, the royal's startling decision to re-sign from his duties was caused by the fact that his father made no attempt to get him ready for the role. She was speaking at the Chalk Valley History Festival, sponsored by the Daily Mail. She said that she did not express any love or appreciation for him and made no attempt to create a connection, which ultimately had very terrible impacts. She was one of the major elements leading up to the abdication, according to her. As a result, while Elizabeth and her father, King George Vi, are known for carefully reviewing official government documents, Professor Ridley claimed that Edward would come back with wine stains and cigarette burns on them. She continued by saying that Edward believed his job was a waste of time and that this was largely a response against his dad who harassed him. In his 1951 autobiography, A King's Tale, Edward discussed his upbringing and his father, claiming that the idea of responsibility was pounded into him. According to Professor Ridley, Edward and his brothers, including the future King George Vi, were terrified of of their father. He yelled at them for minor infractions like arriving five minutes late to supper. She informed them that they would be taken back to their bedrooms. Being yelled at by your father is terrible enough, but it's even worse if your father is the king. These four princes were taught to fear their father from an early age. She continued that George made no effort to get his son ready for the throne, being a king in the traditional sense. As a result, his son rebels against him and his view of kingship. George V and the current queen are renowned for returning their red boxes full of paperwork within hours of receiving them and for being prompt, diligent, and conscientious. In my opinion, they have to perform a lot of work that isn't necessarily interesting. When documents were returned from Edward Vi residence at Windsor, they would have wine stains and cigarette burns on them. Obviously, he wasn't following all the rules of discretion and just believed the entire situation was pointless. I believe that started out in large part as a response to his abusive father. Edward Vi became what he was, a renegade who believed his father was a stupid old man. He realized he didn't want to be king after ascending to the position. Unable to accomplish it, didn't have the self-control to do it, she continued. Edward was given the title of Duke of Windsor and the title of His Royal Highness after he abdicated the throne. Edward and Wallace spent a lot of time hosting elaborate parties and traveling between Paris and New York after receiving criticism for having a meeting with Adolf Hitler in Germany in 1937. 
Even though Lord Snowden's male lover expressed amazement that the couple's romance survived that long, Princess Margaret and Antony Armstrong Jones' troubled marriage lasted 18 years until they ultimately split. In his biography Redeeming Characteristics 2010, British society interior designer Nikki Haslam, 83, claimed that he had a very brief relationship with the later a year before his 1960 nuptials to Queen Elizabeth II's younger sister. Nikki discusses Lord Snowden and Princess Margaret's relationship in ITV's new five-part royal documentary, The True Crown, within the House of Windsor, which premieres on Thursday, April 20th, on ITVX. Nikki explains, Tony was a brilliant seducer. He could seduce the table leg in the first episode, Love and Responsibility. He was great fun, Tony, the devil personified but charming in every way. The socialite declares, he was mischievous but great, and by that I mean naughty in the finest sense, before expressing her amazement that Antony and Margaret were married. The late Princess Margaret's lady-in-waiting, Lady and Glenn Connor, also appears in the episode, although she has some negative things to say about the royal spouse. She claims, I was there for her when she needed me when the marriage started to go south. I observed Tony treating her in a manner that I disapproved of. The issue with Tony was that he acted in such an offensive manner and committed these atrocious crimes. According to Lady Glenn Connor, he tended to leave little notes. The 90-year-old aristocrat, who served as maid of honor at Queen Elizabeth II coronation, tells the show that one of his wife's messages allegedly said, I loathe you. Lady Glenn Connor admits, I truly don't know why he acted that way. I simply felt extremely sad for her. Tony was pretty intelligent, she continues, and he kept up with the queen and the queen mother. Absolutely. In other words, they thought he was fantastic. In another segment of the show, Nikki recounts a less than ideal interaction between the Earl and Princess. The socialite recalls, we were at a party and Tony had one of those old-fashioned matches that would ignite any place when struck on, and he was sort of lighting them and throwing them towards Princess Margaret. Oh, Tony, could you not do that, she pleaded. He said, good thing too, I've always despised that stuff. You could have set my dress on fire. Margaret and Antony originally met in 1958 at a dinner party hosted by their mutual acquaintances. They later married at Westminster Abbey in May 1960, the first royal nuptials to be shown on television. Margaret passed away in 2002 at the age of 71. According to reports, the couple quickly drifted apart after the union, and both royals engaged in extramarital relationships. On the island of Mustique in 1974, Margaret famously brought Roddy Llewellyn, a boyfriend who was 17 years her junior. They were seen on camera by photographers, which led to the breakdown of her marriage. After 18 years of marriage, Margaret and Antony, who passed away in 2017, legally divorced in 1978. The most recent romanticization of Anthony Armstrong Jones and the monarchy occurred in the second and third seasons of the Netflix royal drama The Crown.